Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Sabbath Collective. Uh, we're a community of people interested in celebrating the Sabbath and pursuing God through a Hebraic worldview of the Bible. It is the time of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so we're going to light the Shabbos candles. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to kindle the Sabbath light of, of joy and peace and the festival of Sukkot. This is the last festival from the Leviticus 23 calendar. It's the end of the agricultural year, a seven day harvest of celebration. So the first day of the feast and the last day of the feast are Sabbaths. There's a lot of threads in this teaching we're gonna look at tonight. There's a lot of connections. Uh, it's actually pretty dense and it's pretty deep. So I hope you'll watch it again to see all the beautiful layers we'll talk about in Sukkot. And by the way, I'm just really scratching the surface of Sukkot. Uh, the Hebrew name of the festival is Sukkot. Uh, it's plural for the word Sukkah, which means shelter or stable or huts. It's often translated in English as tabernacles. It was referred to simply as the holiday by the ancient rabbis, and it's one of three pilgrim feasts where Israelites would be required to appear before the Lord at the temple in Jerusalem. <clears throat> if you have your devices or you have your Bibles and you can read these texts with me, Leviticus 23, 42, and 43, and I'm reading from the complete Jewish version, if it's a little different than what you're used to. It's uh, a directive. You are to live in Sukkot for seven days. Every citizen of Israel is to live in a sukkah, so that generation after generation of you will know that I made the people of Israel live in Sukkot when I brought them out of the lands of Egypt. I am Adonai, your God. So during this celebration, the people would bring their offerings to the Lord. So they would come to the temple and they would bring animal offerings, meal offerings, which were flour and oil, drink offerings, which was wine. Uh, people came from every village within the nation and even Jewish people from other countries would travel to make this pilgrimage to the temple. Most often they would arrive in really large caravans uh, for this trip, which was really a wonderful trip for them to, to, to have. Um, sorry, I, I just reduced the size of this. <laughs> it needs to be on 250. Um, so, which was really a wonderful trip for them to make. And so as they would come and as they would gather and meet one another, uh, there would be an air of the anticipation. Uh, there would be an excitement because they knew what was coming. So as they joined closer and closer and closer, they would begin to build these structures. And the structures were the sukkahs or the tents. Thousands and thousands of leafy booths lined the streets and they dotted the surrounding hills and fields. So, according to the laws, all the tents were within a Sabbath day journey of the temple. So they were, imagine this, everyone was really tightly arranged together. So all you would see were these sukkahs, these tents that were all decorated with twinkling lights and everyone was very close together, densely packed. The walls of the sukkah could be made from just about anything, uh, just nothing permanent. The sukkah can be any size, so long as it is large enough for the family to eat and sleep in. And then the roof of the sukkah is supposed to be covered with some sort of foliage or vegetation that grows from the ground. So it can be tree branches, it could be corn stalks, it could be bamboo reeds. It has to provide adequate shade, yet be sparse enough so rain can get in and the stars can be seen through the top of it. So in other words, when you're in a sukkah, you are really exposed. During the course of the seven days of Sukkot, it is appropriate to eat one's meals in the sukkah. And if the climate permits, to actually sleep at night inside the sukkah. It's a time of community and family and fun. So let's ask this question, what is up with the sukkah? 
Why did God direct his people to live or eat in a sukkah for seven days? Well, we just read in Leviticus 23, the verse connected to this. It says you are to live in Sukkot for seven days, we read. <clears throat> Every citizen of Israel is to live in a Sukkah. And then here we see, so that generation after generation of you will know that I made the people of Israel live in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So listen to this sentence again. And pay attention to it. You are to live in Sukkot for seven days. Every citizen of Israel is to live in a Sukkah, that's a tent, so that your generation after generation of you will know that I made the people of Israel live in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So what's up with this? You are to live in a Sukkah so that all the generations will remember that Israel lived in Sukkot? Well, wait a minute, is Sukkot a place or a thing? A very Hebraic answer to that would be yes. <laughs> After the deliverance from uh, the Egyptians, we read in Exodus 12, 37, <clears throat> the people of Israel traveled from Ramses to Sukkot. Sukkot is a place, a literal place. Maybe some of you didn't realize that. And Sukkot, or a sukkah, is also a tent. So why would this place be called Sukkot? Why would God bring his people after the deliverance from Egypt into a place called Sukkot? That's kind of like calling a place a tent city, right? So why would the Lord do this? Why would he bring them there? Why would he call that? Why would he have people remembering this? We see this place, Sukkot, that they stopped was actually named by Jacob. When he left Laban's house in Genesis 33, he builds his home in a place he named Sukkot. And this is the very first time one of the patriarchs is spoken of as building a house. Yet, after he comes into the city and he builds the house, he doesn't call the place house or Bet El or Bet Lahem. Instead, he calls it Sukkot, which connects it to these sort of temporary sheds that he's actually made for his animals. The Torah describes the first house ever built by a patriarch and uses the word Sukkot. And it appears not once, we read, but three times. There's a house, and yet in some way it's not permanent. Remember the first words Yahweh spoke to Abraham, the founder of the Jewish people, were lek laka, which means move. Somehow, Jacob knew that movement and the trust required in that movement was important. And even when he was building a permanent structure, a home for him and for his family, there is the need for relating to that out of a complete trust and obedience. So now he names that city Sukkot. So back to the Israelites. They're delivered from Egypt and the fact that the Lord brings them to this place called Sukkot is significant. <clears throat> Exodus 12:40 says, the time the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. Now, when we read that in English, we just think, okay, it seems like it's a little of an aside. It's sort of out of context, but the time the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. But here's why it's so important to be able to read the Bible in Hebrew. <laughs> Or at least to be able to read the translation if you don't read Hebrew. Here's the literal translation of that sentence. And the settling downs of the children of Israel settled down in Egypt was 430 years. Wow, what's up with that? And the settling downs of the children of Israel settled down in Egypt. So the people were slaves, but they were actually settled in in Egypt. And that's important because in Hebrew, when it's said twice or more, you always pay attention. The settling's downs in it and settle down, it means something. It means, well, you know, you said it twice. Let me really connect to what that means. In Egypt, they had a real home to sleep in, even though they were slaves. They knew where their next meal was coming from. But after their deliverance from Egypt and the Lord brings them to Sukkot, everything changes. 
They were at this place on their own. See, we all think we want freedom, but the air of freedom is heavy. You can make choices, but you can also have consequences of those choices. There are unknown enemies. The only thing they had by way of provisions was a precarious tent to sleep in and some unleavened bread. And so God brings them first to this place, this city, that the patriarch father called Sukkot. They had their freedom, but they didn't have their security. They moved in a great act of faith, but now they were sort of out in the open, only covered by God's embrace, freed of slave masters, but dependent wholly on the Lord. Jeremiah actually shares how Yahweh felt about this time when he first brought his children out from slavery and they were in this place. In Jeremiah 2.2, God actually says, I remember your devotion when you were young. How as a bride, you loved me. How you followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. So God loves this time. The people give the Lord their trust, and it was precious to him. And God responds by providing food and water and guidance and enveloping his people with his cloud, with his presence. And this is what God is connecting the people to, with Sukkot. There is another connection between Sukkot and covering. <clears throat> These clouds of glory that has to do with the Mishkan, Mishkan is Hebrew for tabernacle, and the temple, which is Solomon's temple, a more permanent dwelling. So the verb sukkah in Hebrew means to cover. And that from sukkah is derived from that word, which in rabbinic Hebrew designates the roof of the tent of the sukkah. And it appears in the Torah only in connection with the Mishkan when it speaks of the cherubim, these things, the angel figures that actually sat over the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> and the text said their wings overshadowed it. Rabbinic sources also make these connections with the Mishkan and the Sukkah and Solomon's Temple. A Sukkah stands in the same relationship to a house that the Mishkan or the Tabernacle does in the desert to the Temple in Jerusalem. A sukkah moves, a house does not. Those who live in sukkahs are on a journey. Those who live in a house have arrived and settled in. The sukkah is to the house as the mishkan or tabernacle is to the temple. As long as the temple stood and even after it was destroyed, God wanted the people never to forget the original mishkan in the desert. It was portable. It was the symbol of a people who lived in trust and reliance. More than that, it was the symbol of God himself. Recall the first time we ever hear the word cloud mentioned in connection with Yahweh. It is already the symbol of journey. And Exodus 13, 21 says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. <clears throat> there is movement with the people and God is leading them and he is covering over them. And this is a powerful connection. Notice the connection with Passover here, talking about the deliverance from Egypt and Sukkot. It's connected to the same period of time. However, there's something a little different here. And again, none of this is meaningless. There's no connections when we look at things, or no uh, random coincidences when we look at these connections. Sukkot on the 15th of Tishrei is the exact opposite in the year of Passover. So I want you to see this. This is when Passover is. <clears throat> About six months later, this is when Sukkot is. So Sukkot on the 15th of Tishrei is the exact opposite in the year of Passover, even though these two elements are connected, which celebrate, Passover celebrates the deliverance of the people. When they came out, they had nothing. 
but halfway through the year, when you get as far as possible, as far as the calendar allows you to get from that time, you forget what it's like to be totally dependent on God. You settle down. You build homes out of bricks. But God wants you to remember, and just when you're most likely to forget, he does a celebration to let you know real security only comes from Yahweh. And he, could, he connects us back to that time when we were vulnerable, when we were open, and when we were completely trusted upon God. The sukkah, with its incomplete roof and its door that is open to strangers to invite them in, is the space we make to be exposed, to remember the cloud and God in the cloud that covers the vulnerability of trusting the Lord for our lives. In the sukkah, we remember he's covering over us. We belong to him and everything we have comes from him. This is a celebration of great joy. It is a dramatic shift from the solemn atti attitude of Yom Kippur. The joy here was actually twofold with all of these images. And by the way, we only talked about some of them. It commemorated God's past goodness and provision during the wilderness sojourn. And it trusted in God's present goodness with the completion of the harvest, as well as his future goodness with the anticipation of the rains that was needed for life. Sukkot is unusual because we see two separate ways to relate to this holiday and to God. We see the connection with the species, and by the way, I'm going to talk about this uh, and the wave offering and the other elements in our Sabbath Collective membership group when we meet next. Um, that is actually a paid membership group, and if you'd like to join that, you can just click on the blue sign up button, and we do a more in-depth teaching with a little more interaction in that, in that group. But this is called the Lulav and the Etrav, and these things are uniquely Israel. These are plants that are connected to the country, planted in the ground. The connection was farming and produce and stability. And then we see the booze, B-O-O-T-H, <laughs> which are about being transient, wandering after the deliv deliverance from Egypt, about being vulnerable and exposed, the remembering of the covenantal deliverance and care of Yahweh. So rabbinic scholars say this holiday is unique, that it connects us with the Lord in two ways. We see him as the image of both creator and redeemer. <clears throat> Sages say, you know Ra Yahweh as redeemer through history, and you know him as creator through nature. So we see God through history in the sukkah. He is the Redeemer. He is the Savior. He is the Deliverer that took his people out of bondage. And this is seen through the history, through the stories of the people. This is remembered through looking behind us. The Sukkah is a symbol of his redemption for his people and his care through his covenant. But the Sukkah also opens up in the ceiling to nature. And connects us to nature as well as the these other elements like the lulav and the water and the rain in this celebration and we connect to nature nature connects us to God as the Creator in Judaism we read that nature sings the praises of God so the very fruit <laughs> very nature sings his praises He's someone that we discover by looking at his creation. When we connect with the Lord as creator, we look to nature. And that causes us to look up through the holes in the sukkah. And when we remember to connect to the Lord as redeemer, we remember throughout history. This so-called festival represents Yahweh as creator and redeemer. And that is is why the holiday is described as one of great joy or double joy comes in. Through our biblical stories, through our own stories, and through nature. We celebrate him, his provisions and care and commitment to trust, and we allow ourselves to be exposed, to be vulnerable, to be open. 
And this brings us great joy and celebration. So in this season, go to a park and make a little tent to have a meal in. Or if you are in New York City, they have little portable sukkahs that are actually on the street that they'll allow you to pop in and eat a meal in and visit. If you live somewhere with a backyard, make something a little more permanent. Take the kids out, make a tent and have a meal or even sleep outside. Remember to connect with the Creator and the Redeemer and celebrate Sukkot. Happy Sukkot. And Sabbath Collective members will look at joy and we'll see you on the other side.